rockin' around the Christmas tree at the Christmas party. A mistletoe hung where you can see. So I'm through now at uh, 12 in the Tower Museum and we'll see what the fellow has to say about all the artifacts and how they found it and the highlights of the, the old Tower Museum even. So more on that later. Hello, what's your name? Hi, I'm Ronan and uh, I work here in the Tower Museum. Okay. And uh, great to be invited to be part of your channel again. Uh, what's your name? Uh, Ronan McCall. And uh, what can you tell me about the stall highlights and uh, what, what attract people to come to the stall? Right, so this is, this is a very exciting stall. It's about history and heritage. It's uh, yeah. 7,000 years ago. So in here we have lots of different artifacts on display and things about the new DNA museum that's been built across the river. Okay. So We're going to do a whistle top tour of the Tower Museum, look at all the exhibitions, look at some of the objects and uh, hopefully you can come here and visit. So we're going to start picking up the tunnel and this tunnel is, kind of represents some of the many tunnels that exist underneath the city today. So this is just a wee reconstruction of one. So this takes us up into the story of Derry which tells us all about the history of Derry from about 5000 BC up to the present day. So we'll we just go. St. Colm Kill was also known as St. Columba and was born in the year 521 at Garton in County Donegal. He was During the early Middle Ages, Columban monasticism spread throughout Ireland to places like Kells, Swords, Moon, Tory Island and beyond to as well as the Book of Linda's Farm. So what's of interest in this section? So this is the very first section uh, that you come into in the story of Derry. And the story of Derry starts in terms of humans uh, about, well, 9,000 years ago now. So you're talking about 7,000 BC. First settlers that came to this island came around the north coast and sealed up the river foil. And they brought these kind of tools with them here, you know, axes and flints and different things to cut down trees. Um, they fished and they like de-skilled fish and different things. And they eventually they settled on this little island uh, in the middle of the river and the, it had an oak grove in it, uh, you see here. Um, eventually that name slowly evolved into Dura, the old Irish name, uh, and uh, it became known as the oak grove. And so the oak leaves uh, are very closely associated with the history of Derry um, as a settlement. So we just come out of uh, the prehistoric area and uh, uh, Colm Kill uh, founded a monastery in, in Derry and from there it became a kind of an early medieval settlement um, and so we're coming into that kind of period of medieval history um, which is really strong in Derry and has a really interesting and somewhat violent medieval history. Uh, the, Nor the Vikings came here, uh, the Normans came here and so this area kind of shows some of that and up, up here we have a the effigy of a Norman knight lying in state. And this is found uh, out near Chantalo, 
You can see the head's missing, but the knight still has the armor and the dagger and the grease and different things as well. This is really cool. You don't find this um, very often um, in Ireland. Uh, you might find it in places like Christchurch in Dublin and all. Um, but yeah, it's really cool. It's very exciting. And um, yeah, it's one of our one of our medieval displays. Mm. So what can you tell me about Richard Bartlett presented right here beside you on your right? Right, so Richard there looking very noble, uh, was a cartographer. Cartographer, someone who makes maps. It's like geography but writing, so you know, making maps. And he decided to map Ireland because 400, 500 years ago, Ireland wasn't really that well mapped in terms of, you know, um, the English crown um, going around making maps of areas. And so this area was, you know, part of native Gaelic Ireland. And so eventually uh, English cartographers tried to make their way in. Um, local Gaelic culture and, and um, families and structure uh, in many ways mightn't have taken too kindly to someone because when you map an area, you're kind of mapping it to understand it so that you can eventually maybe conquer it um, or in some way take over it. So Bartlett was actually killed uh, in Donegal as he was making uh, maps, uh, which is fairly tragic, but uh, it's a case of who are you, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. And uh, which ended quite violently, you know. But his maps are still found today um, and they're really detailed. And you can see some of the reconstructions here. I mean, he mapped out some of the forts and some of the wee towns and. And um, yeah, they're really beautiful maps, beautifully coloured. So this case uh, has some items that people who live in the city exactly about 410 years ago were from then about and then further on. So we start back that far and we have some of the very earliest tools like chisels and um, keys and belt buckles and different things that they would have had when they moved into the newly built walled city as such. Um, in the 1970s there was a lot of bomb damage from the troubles, a lot of buildings had to be raised and rebuilt again and when they rebuilt these buildings before they did they started digging the foundations and they started digging into the old 17th century cellars. So you have all the old jugs including some from Germany that people would have drank from, uh, cups that they would have drank from, plates that they would have eaten from bottles of port and wine, and then you have wee leather shoes and different things that they, they would have worn, candlesticks, so this is the kind of day-to-day -day household items that, uh, that people would have had. See these wee combs, see the wee combs are really tightly together uh, there. Um, back then, combs like that, you know, and especially wee small hair combs and different things, um, hair lice and different things would have been a real problem. So uh, you had to have really fine tooth combs to kind of comb out hair lice and all those gruesome kind of uh, ailments that people would have had back then that are pretty much eradicated today. And from what I know, they're made from bone? Yeah, yeah. made from bone, yeah. Um, bone's easy to carve um, and easy to shape. So uh, obviously not human bone, um, but uh, animal bone and different things. It's just basically using uh, resources to the m most of its ability. So if they killed an animal and they ate, ate most of it, they could use the bone then for something else. So it's a uh, sustainable living, um, which a lot of people are kind of getting back into now. So this this really cool sword is uh, the state sword. This is uh, basically what you would use in the old corporation um, and carry with you for like ceremony, civil so ceremony. If you carried the scepter around the corner and you had the state sword, you had some kind of authority uh, bestowed upon you by the crown. Um, this state sword is really interesting. It dates right back to the founding of the city. And if you look really up close in the pommel, you can see the word London and then Dura. And this is the very first known spelling of what became London Derry. But what's really interesting about this is that they used an approximation of the Irish spelling mm -hmm. of Dura. So it's actually London Dare. Um, uh, the word Derry came along later um, and this was to kind of show that the guilds in London were funded um, and provided funds to build the city and the authority to do so by the king so they came from London so that instead of just Dura it was now London Dura or Dura funded by guilds from London. So this is Colonel Robert Lundy and uh, can you tell me about uh, why there's a sign called only the traitor on his chest. 
Yeah, Lundy was uh, is a kind of a he was governor of the city, and um, uh, he was in charge of the defence basically, and um, he, he kind of uh, believed that the city would fall, and so he recommended that the city be abandoned to to the Jacobites at the time. Of course, this this didn't go down well with uh, uh, people living in the city who wanted to resist, and so um, they basically branded him a traitor. And uh, this is one of the uh, uh, large-scale kind of effigies. Um, uh, every year, he's he's, he's um, uh, put up on a kind of a, a large scaffold and set on fire, and you know, so you're setting fire to the, the concept or effigy of the mm -hmm. traitor. Um, it still happens every year, early December. Um, it's quite the sight. So um, yeah, that's that's who Lundy was. And this here was an original dish. This was the template that the, the effigy was made from. So you can see that it's quite. Quite large, like I mean, down the, it had legs and everything at the bottom, and this huge kind of a uh, burning man, so to speak. So yeah, it's it's fascinating. These three lads are uh, designing uh, Derry's first bridge, which you can see opens up quite nicely. Uh, bridges made of wood and uh, went right across there near enough where Everington is at the minute. Um, and it opened up allowing ships right through to Savannah. But believe it or not, there was no bridge until then. Uh, this is the end of the 18th century. Uh, before that, you had to go across on a wee punt or a ferry, and there were loads of different ferry crossings. But that's how people got about. You know, they just got in a little, you know, cut down a tree and, you know, carved out half of it into like a long, almost like a like a longboard or a massive paddleboard, and this is, and then paddled across and paddled goods and all across the river too. I mean, we're not talking about thousands of years ago. This was up until maybe two hundred fifty years ago. So, building a bridge really linked up the two sides of the city, and from then then you have the water side becoming uh, a lot more urban, a lot more built up, and uh, opened it up really uh, to the city that we see today. Uh, and we've had about four bridges since. So this is called the Bone Ship, um, which sounds something like from Car Pirates of the Caribbean, but it's not. It's just a wee ship made from animal bone. It's really beautiful, really detailed. Uh, prisoners in the Napoleonic War, um, French prisoners um, who were captured or arrested. They were put in prisons all around uh, um, Britain and Ireland. And the prisoners in this case, you know, just like all prisoners are making prisoner art, even up to pres present day. The big thing back then was to make little ships out of animal bone. Um, so whatever's left over from dinner and different things, they would make these beautiful carved ships. And this is a, a French ship of the line. I can't I, we could count the cannons, but it's a hundred and something, hundred and something ship of the line. Um, hundred and ten or something, but that's how many cannons are on the ship, you know. Um, so uh, that's basically what they did in prisons back then. So this was the coach of the Knox family. Can you tell me the story behind it? Aye, it's it's uh, it was it was Knox of Prehen, and uh, it's a beautiful coach. And uh, originally it just kind of lay in a kind of a barn, and it was in really poor condition, and it's been absolutely beautifully restored. And I mean the coach is nearly two hundred years old, you know, um, and uh, yeah, it's just beautifully lacquered, and it's got the suspension and. You know, this like this is like the earlier cars. You can see in there, see how that would just bounce up and down that suspension. So, even though the wheel is like iron shod, it wouldn't have been a really uncomfortable ride. It would have actually been pretty comfortable uh, going along. Um, I mean, you couldn't even build these now; they would cost an absolute fortune. But one of the really interesting things about this, I see at the back here, there's a little storage area, and that was for storing weapons in case it was ambushed by highwaymen. And uh, the Knox family have a really famous uh, association um, with the kind of an ambush. Um, Mary Ann Knox was a young girl in the family, and um, there was a fellow called McNaughton who wanted to marry her, but he was a lot older. And so Mary Ann's father didn't like this arrangement at all. Um, and one day he was taking her to Dublin in a coach, just like this, but a bit earlier. And uh, McNaughton ambushed uh, the coach, and he shot Mary Ann by accident, so it was a real tragedy. Anyway, he was due to hang for this, and so they took him to Lufford. And um, nobody wanted to hang him because he was, he was fairly well known. 
but uh, he threw himself off anyway, and uh, he didn't hang. You know, he did, didn't break his neck, and he survived. But he didn't want to be known as, as half hanged. So then he went again, and then he died. But there it is. He is known as half hanged now from now on, and it's, it's a very famous story because of that. So the year that happened, seventeen sixty one. Yeah, yeah, and just before. I mean, this coach is later on, but yeah, the eighteenth century. So here we are, steps all the way up, and then inside. It's actually quite comfortable. Uh, a seat for two, um, three to push, and then at the back here is the uh, that's where the concealed cabin is, and seats for servants, and of course at the top here you have the seat for the driver. Right, so uh, here you have a little road. This is called the road to partition. Um, partition basically being the creation of Northern Ireland um, um, after the War of Independence. And this, this road is kind of the story, you know, from the start. So, and you can see there's painted curbs on either side. And on the left side, you have um, the Unionist Loyalist um, side who want to kind of stay within the United Kingdom don't want to be, don't want home room, um, are happy enough with the arrangements that they're in. And then on the right side you have a more kind of um, a Republican, um, kind of separatist kind of side who want more independence, who want home rule. And so it starts with a story about home rule basically being governed from Dublin um, and eventually devolves into something stronger which is kind of independence from the United Kingdom. But see the way the curves stop? Mm -hmm. That's because you're reaching into the First World War then. And then everybody went to fight in the First World War. Um, the more Republican kind of home rule side uh, fought in the First World War because they thought it would get them a better deal um, afterwards as a kind of a, a gratitude thank you. And of course you have the loyalist unionists fighting in the, in the First World War as well. So um, when you come out of that kind of home rule kind of early 20th century into a more kind of a War of Independence, the colours start up again. Um, and then behind you have cases of artefacts from those volunteers and people who, who fought in uh, various uh, war events for some He also volunteered for anxious to demonstrate to the 32nd Ulster Division of the leaders, known as the Darius. The Nationalist leader, John Redmond, opened his print. So this is our display on the, on the Troubles, and um, this is just a small kind of representation of some of the bigger collections that we have. So here you have some um, uniforms and weaponry from the security forces, and um, some kind of uh, models of Land Rovers. They were made by member staff, they're really good. And um, over here then you have kind of more of the kind of culture of the Troubles. Um, so you have little stamps with kind of propaganda on them and badges and, you know, badges to do with the Republican movements, the Penance movement, civil rights. Um, and then you also have badges to do with Loyalist and Unionist um, as well. Um, and some of them kind of, you have coins kind of defaced with Irish, you know, Irish Republic of Ireland coins with 1690 on them um, and then you have little uh, 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 kind of stamps on them and slogans and different things and then of course you have some prison art made by prisoners um, and then over on this side then you have more of the kind of paramilitary history so um, easier have some UDA and IRA and even have some um, poetry written by Bobby Sands so uh, this case is, is just really different. Um, it has some of the kind of um, ammunition that would have been used during the troubles and then on the back you have this kind of armoured glass and diff diff different ammunition is tested against it. So you can see the stamps to show um, how effective it would have been. 
of course here then you have um, the rubber bullets um, which were fired a lot and could cause a lot of injury but I think a lot of people um, from here especially when they were children would kind of pick up these rubber bullets and trade them with each other and different things and it's just it became a real part of the um, kind of life in Northern Ireland for many years so um, you know you nearly wouldn't see this case passing it but when you stop and look at it it's got some really interesting detail where I'm standing at the minute is the top of the Tarry Museum, but this is not really well known on the south of Derry because people don't normally come up here, it's usually tourists. And I thought it'd be good to uh, include them in the video, they show uh, a 360 around the city. And uh, if you go over here, we have uh, the VT Baldwin and we have the Sajid Cathedral up here. And this here will be the bog side. And then if we move over here to our right, we can see the Guild Hall over here. And we can see uh, Waterside and the River Foyle. And further on up there is the Foyle Bridge. You can barely just see it there, but uh, if you get a view from it from here, and not only the old pigeons. And then because it's Christmas time, obviously, we have a Christmas tree down here. And then a little bit of a fact for you, um, the Guild Hall used to be situated in the diamond, the center of the diamond. But uh, they moved it then, whenever they started building up here at the uh, outside ship key gate, when they started building up roads and things like that, they moved the Guild Hall down to there, so that's when the government office became down there. So over here now, as you have the main shopping center, which is uh, Foyle side, over here, and uh, over there over the train station, and Waterside. And uh, over there would be the nerve center, and then inside we're actually inside the walls as well. So I think that's what concludes my section. So I hand over the Ron McConnell now. tried to sail around Ireland and so that's why the shipwreck happened in Canigo Bay but when you go down through these levels you find out about it so this basically looks like the deck of a ship on the galleon of a Spanish Armada. Strong winds from the south blew the Armada into the North Sea away from the tunnels. Some English men had gone and intervened to save them with a constant wind. A hundred years later the besieged citizens of Derry would welcome the silver so we've come out of this section that tells you about the history of the Um and there's some really cool armour and different things there that you know we can't really follow but if you come and see them up close so they, you know, it looks really cool and uh, we come now down to this story about finding the ship and the ship was found by divers from the city of Derry so back well, they would walk you know, every weekend and spend some time um, bringing up parts of the ship, which is just uh, out, just in Kennego Bay, just a wee bit out and kind of shallow enough water. But what they did was really amazing. And what they did kind of set the bar for underwater archaeology um, for the future, you know. And a lot of them were amateurs, so it really was a massive achievement. So when we come down into this gallery, we kind of find out what they uncovered, the whole story of the dive, and some of the really beautiful items that they brought up from the seabed and put out on display here in the museum. Some of the old equipment that 
the hoodie you used. I had not changed that much, but it's changed a wee bit. But it was really heavy. I mean, when you go in underwater, it's a bit lighter. But still, you have to lug this all the time. These cylinders of gas and different things. And these are lead weights to kind of keep you down at the bottom if you need to be, so that you can actually spend some time rooting around and trying to find things. Brush aside sand and all that. Yeah. This is what divers look like in the early 1970s. There was no digital at all, it was all analog, all dials and different things. There was no uh, screens or anything to tell you that you need to come up. Uh, and there was all just the science and learning behind it that people gained through experience. So, on this level, you kind of see a lot more detail in the cases of what people uncovered, but it's beautiful musical instruments, uh, bits of clothing. Um, pots and pans and pewter. Um, we even have a bowl from the Ming Dynasty from China. Um, the Trinidad Baths there was an old Venetian merchant ship. And then if you look in here too, you see bits of cannon and pumps and different things in the ground. So, you know, if you want to see it in more detail, come along and see it. Um, you can spend hours in here working your way down through. Um, it's a great gallery. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm doing the VR headset now, which you've probably seen the Martin video. So um, I'm doing a section called uh, Under the Sea, I think it is. And uh, this fella called Colin is going to record me doing the VR headset. So thanks very much, Colin.
According to legend, it was around 546 AD that St. Colum Kill built a monastery in an oak grove on an island in the River Foyle. As the monastery grew, it became known as Dura Colum Kill. Dirty mine, my small oak grove, little cell, my home, my love. O oh, thou Lord of lasting life, woe to him who brings it strife. The original 6th century Columban Monastery was probably located on the site now occupied by St. Augustine's Chapel. St. Colum Kill was also known as St. Columba and was born in the year 521 at Garton in County Donegal. <coughs> he was the founder of a great monastic tradition. During the early Middle Ages, Columban monasticism spread throughout Ireland to places like Kells, Swords, Moon, Tory Island and beyond, to Iona and Lindisfarne. Saint Columba was a literary man and a scribe, founder of that tradition which produced manuscripts like the Katha, the Book of Durham, the Book of Kells, as well as the Book of Lindisfarne. Derry was an important part of the Columban Federation of Monasteries, and in the 12th century, the great abbot Flahertoch of Brudehorn made Derry the headquarters of all the Columban churches in Ireland. And in 1166, the medieval cathedral, Champor Moor, was built on a site near the present Long Tower Church. In the 13th century, the monks of Derry adopted the Augustinian rule, and it was the late medieval Augustinian church which survived to become the first place of worship for the 17th century English colonists. For a thousand years, from the 6th to the 16th century, the monastery of Derry and the settlement around it developed. Reminders of the medieval settlement can still be seen in many aspects of the city's life today. The Long Tower Church in the area around it is one example. The present tower museum is another. The original tower house, a fortified manor house, was built by the Adonides in the 16th century, and now the reconstructed tower forms part of this museum. In many other ways, the traditions of Derry going right back to that first monastery in the ancient oak grove, still live on in the hearts of its people. <laughs> Derry was an ideal point of embarkation for many immigrants who left the north of Ireland for the new world in the 18th and 19th centuries. There were two distinct waves of emigration. The first was in the 18th century when many Presbyterian monster Scots, oppressed by laws which denied them the right to worship as they pleased, and impoverished by ever-increasing land rents, resolved to leave the country altogether. One of the earliest transatlantic immigrants from the Northwest was the Reverend James McGregor of Ahadui, who, in 1718, led most of his congregation to North America. He likened himself in his sermons to Moses leading the chosen people into the promised land. He and five shiploads of his followers eventually settled in what is now New Hampshire, christening their settlement London Derry. All over New England, other towns soon sprang up with names like Antrim, Hillsborough, and Derry. Throughout the 18th century, most immigrants were carried on American ships which brought black seed into the country for the linen industry and returned with passengers. Because the ships were mostly designed as cargo vessels, the kind of accommodation they could offer 
was usually cramped and extremely uncomfortable. Frequently, there were outbreaks of disease on board, and many of the most vulnerable never survived the voyage. People who could not afford the fares in New England would often finance their passage by signing on as indentured servants. This meant, in effect, that they had mortgaged their labour and would work for four years for an American employer in return for the passage and subsistence. Sometimes whole families would pledge themselves in this fashion. However humble their origins may have been, many of the Ulster Scots were to play leading roles in American history. People like Andrew Jackson, the American president, Thomas Mellon, founder of one of the world's richest dynasties, and Charles Thompson, the first secretary of the United States Congress, were either emigrants themselves or first generation Ulster Scots. Frontiersman David Crockett was the son of the County Derry man. The city prospered greatly from the growth of immigration. Many services and trades were required to keep large numbers of ships properly equipped and stocked, and hotels and hostelries were quick to take advantage of what were often long delays before sailing. The city's merchants and shippers grew wealthy, but the city itself did not grow much beyond the original walled area by the end of the 18th century. However, the population quadrupled since the start of the century and now stood at 11,000. By 1815, some of the local merchants were beginning to awaken to the full potential of the shipping trade. With Canadian boats, they set up their own transatlantic trading firms, taking emigrants on the outward journey to destinations like St. John, New Brunswick, and returning with cargoes of timber. constant attack from German U-boats. As a key communication centre and port, Derry played a crucial role in protecting the vital convoys. As the war progressed, Derry became a major military centre with thousands of personnel from many different countries. The impact on Derry's economy was huge, not to mention its social life. After the war, Derry slipped back into economic depression. The population increased hugely and unemployment rose to 20%. Continuing a long history of emigration to escape poverty, one-eighth of the entire population, both Catholic and Protestant, left the city in the 1950s. Another problem was housing. Two or three families lived in one house. Many families squatted in the temporary huts which had been abandoned by the military. At the root of the situation was discrimination. Despite being in a minority, the Unionists controlled the council, known at the time as the London Dairy Corporation. Only householders could vote in local elections, so giving someone a house also meant giving them a vote. So the council, ran by the Unionists at the time, weren't inclined to extend the franchise to the Nationalists. They only built houses in wards where they could be guaranteed support. This is a process called gerrymandering. Discrimination in employment was also rife in the city. A tradition of self-help sprang up. A group of local community activists set up Derry Credit Union to help the worst off. It began with only four members and just seven pounds in its account. Derry Credit Union is still one of the strongest community organisations in the city today. In 1965, Cole Rain was proposed for the location of a new university. The people of Derry disagreed. A cross-party motorcade of 5,000 people, both nationalist and unionist, travelled to Stormont to make their case. The protest was unsuccessful, but it gave the new generation of educated nationalists the chance to hone their organisation skills. John Hume belonged to the first generation in Northern Ireland to gain access to free public education. Other newly educated activists on both sides also seized the opportunity to improve conditions for their community, to escape the endless cycle of poverty and unemployment. They were inspired by the wave of reforms sweeping the world, such as the anti-Vietnam war protests, Prague Spring 
and the American Civil Rights Movement. It was the 60s, and everything seemed possible. The people of Derry died united when their minds go right and will march and protest on the magnificent event. Derry Housing Action Committee was formed in March 1968 to draw attention to the very poor housing situation. In October that year, the Civil Rights March was banned, but the organisers <coughs> went ahead anyway. The clash with the police at Duke Street was televised around the world, and the Northern Ireland troubles had begun, and continued for decades. After more and bigger protest marches, London Dairy Corporation was abolished, and a development commission took over the running of the city but it did little in the short term to ease the tensions. 1969 was a year of violent confrontation between the police and the nationalist community of Derry. One of the key events was the Battle of the Bogside. For a short period during the summer of 1969, the people of the Bogside saw themselves as living in a free Derry, an independent community outside the control of the British state. In August, at the height of the Battle of the Bogside, the police were withdrawn and replaced by the British Army. To begin with, relations between the local people and the army were good, but the honeymoon wasn't to last. Nineteen seventy one was a terrible year. Amid the escalating violence, the army shot dead two young men, Desmond Beatty and Seamus Cusack, claiming that they had been armed. This is a claim the local people strongly denied, and recruitment to the provisional IRA soared in the following weeks. The government introduced internment without trial. The IRA started a bombing campaign, and many of Derry's landmark buildings were destroyed. But worse was still to come, Bloody Sunday. On the 30th of January 1972, 13 people taking part in a civil rights march were shot dead by troops of the Parachute Regiment. 14 others were seriously wounded, and another man died of his wounds later. The soldiers said they'd been fired on. Woodbury inquiry was seen by the nationalist community as a whitewash. A second, more detailed inquiry conducted by Lord Savile was opened in 1998. Bloody Sunday remains one of the most controversial episodes of the Troubles. The bombings and shootings continued and the political situation worsened. In July 1972, Operation Motorman saw the army move back to the bog side. <laughs> 